Welcome to the Governance Podcast from the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society here at King's College London. I'm Mark Pennington, the Director of the Centre. In November last year, we were very pleased to host Professor William Easterly to give a public lecture on paternalists versus liberals in economic development. Bill is Professor of Economics at New York University and is one of the world's leading authorities on the political economy of economic development. As well as numerous articles, he's the author of three highly regarded books, The Elusive Quest for Growth, The White Man's Burden, and The Tyranny of Experts. A central theme in these works is that development economists often claim to know more about how to promote economic development than is justified, and that the consequence of following their advice is often a combination of poor economic and social outcomes alongside threats to human freedom. I'm very pleased to have Bill as my guest on the Governance Podcast today. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Mike. Okay, Bill. So I mentioned in my introduction there that one of the key themes in in certainly your works of the last 20 years has been this kind of scepticism about economic expertise, certainly in the developmental uh, area. And I wanted to start by asking you, is this scepticism towards economic expertise, something that you felt all the way through your career? Or is it something that sort of emerged as a result of your own experiences in this in this field? Yeah, I would say it's a second. It's something that was growing over time in reaction to my experiences at the World Bank with, with myself being a, a supposed development expert, offering advice to poor countries where I was traveling for the World Bank. So I guess that alludes to the, the the subtitle of the elusive quest for growth. If 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 my memory serves me right, is economists' adventures and misadventures in the tropics. Right. So right. Could you say a little bit right. of, about those adventures and misadventures? Yeah. So when I joined the World Bank, I I started going to to Ghana in 1985, which I had lived in as a child actually. And you know, at that time, it was very noticeable how Ghana had been a disaster thanks to the kind of policies ad advocated by development people for a long time of emphasis on planning rather than markets. And then, you know, another formative experience was uh, going to what was still the Soviet Union in 1990, which is not technically in the tropics, but, yeah. but uh, was also a kind of a shocking experience for me that. You know, when I, the first kind of day that I was in Moscow, I was like, wow, this really did not work. <laughs> so everything is so shabby and dysfunctional and ugly and gray and dark. And that, that sort of, you know, made me wonder why development economists have been pushing the remedies that failed so catastrophically in Ghana and, and Soviet Union for so long. And, you know, why we were still trying things that also, themselves were not super successful at first. So in the 90s, the, the World Bank was pushing structural adjustment loans, which were trying to sort of force countries to do economic reform. And they were not successful at achieving the desired economic reforms by doing that. Hmm. And so the loans themselves could not be repaid because they hadn't generated anything productive. So the, the debt crisis of African countries in the 90s was kind of a reflection of that that failure. And then the Soviet Union, as it transitioned to being a post-communist economy with the uh, independence of, of Russia and other Soviet republics, that was not a great success either at first. The, the inflation was in the thousands of percent. The, the output was cratering by 30, you know, 30 or 40 percent decline. So it looked like not only did we not get the answers right with the previous generation of development economists who were advocating planning instead of markets, but we also didn't seem to know how to get out of planning and to have a, a, a transition to markets that would yield, you know, big economic gains. So that, that sort of like, uh, you know, overwhelmingly negative experience is what sort of what kind of convinced me to change course and become a lot more skeptical and doubtful about the World Bank. And that's about when I left the World Bank was 2001 because of because of that. Yeah, I mean, this this is something we can perhaps like explore a little bit more in the the conversation. But I think it's 
it's really important to stress that in your work, on the one hand, you have got this scepticism of, if you like, anti-market arguments, which are claiming that planning experts know better than people. But at the same time, you're also equally skeptical of a kind of pro-market expertise that believes that you can sort of just transplant market institutions into societies that don't currently have them. Or if they do have them, maybe they're in a very sort of distorted form. Um, So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that this leads to a totally pessimistic view of the world, but it, it's certainly, I think, important to bring out that you're you're critical of both those forms of expertise. Yes, that's that's definitely correct. And you know, I mean, I think I sort of learned from that from experience over time, also on the crit- the criticism of sort of pro market experts. I think, you know, I was initially very critical of them in the, in. The 2001 book, The Elusive Quest for Growth. Yeah. I think I've since been convinced that to be more kind to them than I than I was at that time. I think what they did get right, what the World Bank and the IMF and other pro market experts at that time did get right, is just that these extreme distortions were were catastrophic and had to be done away with as quickly as possible. You know, so inflation in the thousands of percent is always disastrous. You just want to get out of that as soon as possible. Yeah. You know, having a high black market premium on foreign exchange that makes it very hard for exporters to, to export or have, you know, domestic price controls on export goods like as, like Ghana had in the 1980s when I was first arriving there, you know, where the, the cocoa exporters were forced to turn in their their goods at the at a, a officially suppressed price level to the domestic cocoa marketing board which gave them about 6% of the world price and, and that had killed off cocoa exports in Ghana. So, you know, getting those things right, uh, I think does have some clear, clear benefits. And I think the pro-market experts did, did get that right. I mean, when Ghana indeed did start doing those reforms when I was traveling there in the, in the mid 1980s, Ghana did have a big growth turn. And uh, since then, you know, the evidence I've seen is that there are kind of big growth turnarounds when you just get out of the extremes so that you can get sort of some cheap, pretty predictable gains when you just get out of those extremes of extreme high inflation, extreme trade distortions, et cetera. But still, it's, it's it still doesn't make it like an easy problem to just say, mm-hmm. oh, you know, liberalize, privatize, stabilize, then mm-hmm. the problem is solved. Everything is easy. You know, prosperity will arrive overnight. That's, that's too easy. Like you said, it, if a, a society is lacking pro market institutions or if the politics are unfavorable, then it's not going to be so easy, even with pro market reforms, to generate generate growth. And I think maybe the, the over promising that happened with uh, those who are doing pro market reform, especially in Latin America and Africa, I think I think hurt hurts the cause of pro market reforms. And if you look at you know, if you look at some of those institutions today. The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, these kind of institutions. Do you think that they've they've learned those lessons, or do you feel that they're, you know, so do you think the state of knowledge in that sense has improved over the last 25 years, or do you feel that there's a, a sort of new generation of mistakes being sort of developed by these by these institutions? Yeah, you know, I think they have learned them for for a while, and. Uh, you know, part of the problem was it's not so easy, even if you learn the lessons to know what to do about them. Yeah. How, can, how can you, even if you understand that institutions are necessary, what do you do about seeing those good institutions arrive in any poor country mm-hmm. that, that uh, experts are trying to, to diagnose a, a cure to poverty? So that, that it wasn't that they weren't learning. It was just that it, even if you learn, it's not so easy and people want, really want the easy answers. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, then I think what's happened more more recently is we've sort of forgotten some of the some of the successes that we did have getting out of those extreme anti-market policies. And I think now, you know, with sort of all the skeptic skepticism about what is called neoliberalism, mm-hmm. you know, the sort of retrospective dismissing of the Washington consensus, the the set of pro-market policies that were agreed upon in Washington in the early 1990s, I think re- represents a kind of new wave of amnesia that there was success getting out of the extremes. 
And now we've forgotten that. And now the, the risk is, you know, countries will be drifting back into the extremes. I mean, Argentina went back into high inflation. Zimbabwe went back into high inflation. Yeah. And, you know, that, that, that the sort of lesson, like, just don't do stupid, <laughs> don't do stupid stuff, you know, which I think mm. was Obama's motto about foreign policy, which was, of course, not exactly adopted. Just don't do stupid stuff is kind of a very underrated recommendation in, in policy. And when you forget that, then you, you start drifting back into the stupid stuff and you're sort of focusing on something that's more difficult. So the critique of neoliberalism is about a lot about inequality, you know, rising inequality, mm. which is an even more difficult problem to solve than than just getting mm. simple economic growth, economic growth is. And I think that was sort of a there was sort of like an escalation, like you failed to solve the easiest problem. Now let's escalate to a more difficult problem. <laughs> Well, neglecting and forgetting what we did to solve the easier problem. Yeah, that 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 has been an unfortunate development in the current generation. That's that's kind of in power in the, in the World Bank and the IMF and the U.S. Treasury under under Biden. And mm-hmm. you know that that's that's sort of an unfortunate setback. And do you where do you think that is coming from? Is that coming from? a new set of experts, or is that partly being driven by, you know, a lot of the po- kind of populist movements that are operating in various parts of the world at the moment that are kind of very sceptical of trade, sceptical of, of markets? It seems to me, I my sense is it's, it's partly coming from experts, but it's also these kind of more bottom-up forces or political forces that are pushing forward certain narratives that people in these institutions feel they have to respond to or give some kind of credit to in some sense. Is that fair? Yeah, it's some combination of both, I think. Uh, maybe there's this, maybe a sort of like toxic interaction between <laughs> between some of the experts and some of the populist movements. That yeah. the experts say, you know, we we want you to care about inequality as, as the main yeah. thing that we're, that we're you know, recommending. And, you know, so we expect you to, to vote for, you know, what the experts tell you you should be voting for, which is sort of redistribution, redistributionist policies. Mm. And when, when the working class fails to vote that way, then they say, well, you're too stupid to, to appreciate what's in your own material self-interest, you know, so the, the only cure is that just that we somehow finally educate you out of your own stupidity. Yeah, and you can understand why a populist movement would kind of make hay out of re- reacting to to that yeah. kind of that kind of expertise. That's you know, yeah. calling the voters stupid is not a great formula for winning elections. And even when you have some of the atrocious candidates that populists have, they can win elections because they're they have an understandable revolt against the sort of condescension and insults of the of the. Yeah. The experts that are identified mainly with the kind of more left of center parties. Yeah. You know, this is a big narrative in the US, has been a big narrative in the US for a long time. You know, there's sort of like mm. there's this book, What's the Matter with Kansas? You know, why aren't yeah. Kansas, why isn't Kansas voting for the redistributionist policies that we think is in their own yeah. interest to address inequality in Kansas? Apparently, has Kansans apparently have different priorities than that. And, you know, it's not because they're stupid, it's because they have different priorities than, than that, or they don't believe that these policies are are either what they want or are going to be effective in achieving the, the gains the experts think they will. You know, more recently, Paul, Paul Krugman wrote a, a column in sort of the same spirit mm. just a, a few days ago. He, you know, what's what's wrong with rural, rural white America that there's so much mm. rage? And, you know, again, mm. there's sort of, he almost came out and said explicitly, you know, they're too dumb to appreciate with their, their own self-interest. So they follow, they fall for the populace to make America great again, kind of, kind of narrative. And you know, that, that explains why they don't vote for the Democratic Party that's offering these redistribution of solutions. Of course, the other theory is the one I just gave. They, they don't vote for people who call them stupid, which is, I think, a much more persuasive theory than, than the other well, one. Well. I mean, the, the, another example, I, I probably shouldn't single him out, but I'm actually going to. Another example of this is uh, Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. he has a new book out, which is another assault on neoliberalism, in effect, by the look of it. But it, it's striking to me that, you know, it's only 15 years ago 
he was um, advising Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and making public statements about how the Venezuelan model offered so much potential for the future. And yet when the model implodes, he doesn't actually appear and say, I got that wrong. <laughs> He just goes off and attacks somebody else. And it seems to me experts from whichever side of the sort of political spectrum they're on, you know, when things go wrong, they should at least kind of fess up to the mistakes that they may have made. Yeah, I was in a, a debate with Joe about this a, a few years ago. And, you know, to be fair to him, I think he wasn't really advocating you know, here's, yeah. you should do like extreme price controls that cause all good supply to dry up and yeah. you know, extreme inflation and all the other stuff. But I think, as you said, he, he was very sympathetic to a kind of democratic socialist ideology that seemed to be represented by Chavez and, and Maduro. And then maybe it was not clear enough in pointing out that the extremes were, were very destructive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so th that I think is, is what's, and the same thing I see in a lot, much less extreme way, Dan, Danny Roderick that is, you know, yeah. perpetually criticizing the neoliberalism yeah. and, and the Washington consensus and so on. I, I don't think Danny really thinks anything. I think I, he, I've heard him say that, yes, extreme policies are very destructive and they destroy yeah. the economy. Yeah. But he doesn't spend enough time kind of pointing that out. This is what the pro market crowd got, got right. Mm. And, you know, it really would be a lot better if Venezuela and Zimbabwe and Argentina were exiting yeah. from those extremes. And if you want to call that neoliberal, that, that should be okay, because getting out of that stuff is, is going to have huge benefits. And the, the anti-neoliberal people have just not made clear enough that that's, that's the situation in, in a number of countries. Okay, well, I wonder, I wonder if we can just change tack a little bit. So. You know, what we've been talking about so far, I guess, are some of these, you know, technical debates really within economics about what 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 are good institutions. But when you gave your your talk to us back in November, you actually mm -hmm. looked at what I thought was a, as a different type of issue, although it's a related one, which mm -hmm. was the importance of dignity in mm -hmm. economic analysis. And you started your remarks off with, I thought, a very potent description of a young African woman entrepreneur feeling frustrated by the fact that whenever she spoke to certain Western sort of development theorists or actually even investors, that they were speaking to her as though she was a charity case that needed to yeah. be helped rather than as a sort of proactive agent. Um, and that brought yeah. out in your your discussion that economic development is has got to be as much about dignity and the process through which people actually acquire development as it is about specific outcomes. I wonder if you could speak right. a little bit to, to that distinction. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something I've gotten a lot more interested in in the, in the last few years, in which I'm, I'm writing a book about now, sort of the the history of development in, in ways that address does development deliver dignity and not only material material goods and kind of the, the liberal if we think of sort of the classical liberal tradition that goes back to adam smith it was very much about you know seeing human beings as having a, a demand for not only material needs but also a demand for for agency to be in control of their own their own destiny to be able to consent to their their own progress to not be the passive passive object of someone else's plan for them without having the right to consent to reject what their what someone else is saying is is good for them for their own development and progress. So you, you, this definitely goes back way into colonial times when basically the colonizers were saying, you know, we think we can offer you a lot of material development if you're just willing to give up your, your right to agency, your right to consent. You know, we're going to force on you what we think is good for you. And if you're just willing to not complain too much about being forced, you will get great material gains. And that uh, that was pretty extreme in colonial times. Even there were theories of even benevolent slavery that, you know, yeah. people like uh, Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill were fighting against very much. And that's sort of where this liberal tradition of stressing agency and dignity really, really got launched in, the, in those kind of battles. 
And certainly we don't have anything that extreme today in development, but it's still the sense that there's the sense that, you know, if we're sort of ruthlessly going to do anything and everything to give you better, better outcomes as far as, you know, greater prosperity and peace, then it doesn't sort of matter how we violate your dignity along, along the way. So you know, some kind of semi-ridiculous examples of this that, that uh, Magat Wade was reacting to, the, the, the woman you mentioned. Yeah. She was reacting to something that was happening just at the time she was writing that column that I quoted, which was there was a, you know, a campaign to fight Ebola in West Africa. And to fight Ebola, this group of uh, musicians that had done a kind of notorious concert back in 1984 about the Ethiopia famine when they recorded this really <laughs> insulting <laughs> and pretty uh, absurd song called Do They Know It's Christmas? Yeah, I remember that very well. <laughs> yeah, Do They Know It's Christmas? And so that you know, generated a lot of fur furious reaction at the time of how insulting and, con and mm. inaccurate and condescending that was, you know, just portraying Ethiopians and really all Africans just like famine victims with swollen bellies and children with flies on, the, on their eyes, which is on the picture of the Do They Know It's Christmas album. And there was some backing off of that kind of what was called poverty porn. And certainly not, most aid agencies do not embrace that kind of extreme. But Magat Wade saw this happening over and over again. I mean, there was another wave of Do They Know It's Christmas and Band Aid concerts around 2005 when there was a big campaign at the, at the G8 uh, yeah. summit to get more aid for Africa. And then when Ebola came along, these same musicians reissued Do They Know It's Christmas again and, you know, had lines like, there's no, there's hope and dread in West Africa and every kiss brings death, you know, referring to Ebola. And this made Magat Wade furious because she was from Senegal, which had a grand total of one, one Ebola case. He, Ebola was super tragic for its victims, but not at all characteristic of all of yeah. Africa or even all of West Africa. Yeah. And, you know, when she's then trying to do her business negotiations with partners, you know, her partners are, are seeing her and and you know, Af West Africans or all Africans is sort of like the kind of helpless victims that are portrayed in, in those in those songs. And you know, is kind of amazed that she would be thinking about you know kind of trying to launch a cosmetics company instead of you know just urgently soliciting charity for poor children dying of Ebola and famine and so on. And you know, lots of Africans had that kind of furious furious reaction. You know, there was a, another. Nigerian writer named Teju Cole who wrote something pretty pretty impressive called the White Savior Industrial Complex, reflecting that kind of furious reaction to being being insulted. So the message is that you know whenever you offer some kind of gain to the people you're supposedly helping and raising awareness about and soliciting donations for, you know, you're offering them the same kind of bargain that was not a bargain that was offered in colonial times. You know, let us take away mm. your dignity in return for giving you mm. kind of peace and prosperity. And a lot of people in Africa and elsewhere do not seem to be willing to take that deal. You know, they're fighting, they have been fighting furiously for two centuries for their, their right to self-determination instead of, you know, being and instead of accepting this division of the world and, you know, the West and the rest or the developed yeah. and developing or the, those well, who are the givers and those who are the receivers, they, they want, you know, a kind of more fundamental moral equality that everyone gets the same respect for dignity, the same, the same right to choose in their own situations. Yeah, well, I mean, just what you were saying there, I mean, and also I remember when I was listening to the, the talk that you gave, I mean, it sounded and quite unusually, actually, coming from someone who's an economist, the language you were using sounded very reminiscent of a lot of the arguments that post-colonial theorists make, which complain about even the, the whole discourse of development economics presupposes that there's this division between countries that have developed that will be exporting yeah. their institutions to those that have to be developed. And there's a kind yeah. of power hierarchy which assumes that there is this kind of superior wisdom that some people should accept from other parts of the world. And it was very unusual hearing an economist use that kind of language. And, and I wondered, is, is there something 
within economics that means that is resistant to that kind of thought? Does it does it see it as too ideological, not scientific? And if so, why do you think that is the case? Yeah, well, so if someone is saying this is not scientific, they're completely correct. This is not scientific. Yeah. This is not a scientific debate. This is not about yeah. how to achieve better results on poverty. Hmm. It's it's much more like a, a moral debate. That's yeah. which which I think is necessary for for someone in development to have. I don't I don't know if economists have the right special specialization for that, but it is necessary for someone to kind of chance some or many people that are already challenging this, kind of challenging this assumption that anything in the name of development is sort of justified. So mm. there's this sort of implicit moral assumption that anything that achieves moral development, I'm sorry, anything that achieves material development is sort of morally justified. That's the sort of implicit moral assumption. Mm. And then the, the challenge to that is to say, well, wait a moment, that doesn't seem to be what people are happy with, that, that deal of of having you know moral injury to themselves at the, at the cost of getting better better material outcomes and this this assumption that anything is justified in the name of development that's been you know sort of why overwhelmingly rejected over and over again in the history of the campaigns against colonialism and the slave trade the campaigns against you know king leopold's congo hmm. which was you know making the congo prosper but at the cost of forced labor and amputations of hands and and, you know, you think of this sort of anti-colonial movement as being like a, a pretty left-wing kind of anti-liberal movement. And that's, that's mm. lar largely correct. What's been forgotten is there was and still is a kind of liberal anti-colonial viewpoint. That the problem with colonialism was not that it was like, you know, uh, something that the capitalists use to enrich themselves, which is somewhat true, but it's not the only thing going on. That's sort of the thing that the anti-colonial left is reacting against. But also colonialism was sort of violating liberal ideals mm. by having, you know, sort of coercion instead of consent. You know, liberals hate mm. coercion by having paternalism instead of individual and collective self-determination. Liberals hate paternalism. And that by having inequality where some groups are not are denied the right to consent and the right to self-determination, while other groups are given the or have their rights respected for their ability to consent and self-determination. So this radical sort of inequality is also very much against liberal, you know, traditional liberal liberal values. And you know, one way to think about it is, you know, if you have an anti-liberal policy, then you know, and it will often generate an anti-liberal reaction, but two anti-liberals do not make a liberal. <laughs> you, don't, yeah. you don't get to liberalism that way. But what you do need to recognize is if you have these long history of anti-liberal policies, you're creating a demand for dignity that will either be met in an anti-liberal way, which will be, you know, very bad for the people concerned and in the long run, or it, or it can, can and could be met in a liberal way. And what, you know, I think what the liberals have, have offered throughout their history is trying to offer a liberal way to meet your demands for the right to consent and individual and collective self-determination and fundamental moral equality of all groups. And that's that's what economists, you know, not only Adam Schwartz, John Stuart Mill, but a 20th century uh, economists much identified with kind of libertarian values as Ludwig von Mises, who also was very vehement against colonialism. Isaiah Berlin, when he came along, was very, very critical of colonialism, very sensitive to this kind of demand for dignity by, by colonial, ex-colonial peoples and how understanding that the colonial people might, might prefer a, an autocrat of their own group to an autocrat mm -hmm. imposed on them by, by another group that claims to be superior to them. So that, that's sort of where we are now. I think we're, we're by stressing only material material outcomes, we're really losing the losing the battle of ideas and values with uh, the anti-liberal tyrants around the world. Well, we, I mean, in a moment, I want I might try to connect this back to the earlier discussion about economics directly, but I wonder why is it that there are certainly it strikes to me relatively few economists, even those who are broadly within the liberal tradition 
who are making the kind of arguments that you're putting forward. So, I mean, you gave very powerful remarks in, in your, your talk to us about the way Adam Smith at, at times made some very strong statements against colonialism. And you also mentioned just now von Mises also making strong anti-colonial arguments. But in general, people in the liberal tradition, if they're not they're not pro-colonialist, they're not necessarily associated with anti-colonial arguments. Right. Do, you, do, right. I wonder, do you have any thoughts on why that is the case? Uh, you know, I think maybe anti-colonialism has been captured so almost exclusively by the left that they sort of instinctively react against that. Yeah. And, you know, great, great liberal development economists like P.T. Bauer sort of. Yeah had that problem, sort of failed to perceive the, the sort of injury to dignity that was happening with colonial, colonialism. Mm -hmm. And there's this temptation by, by liberals, you know, that you, you, want, you know that you need to have the institutions, as we were talking about earlier, to, to achieve, you know, a, a liberal market markets of prosperity. And, you know, so there's this temptation to think, oh, maybe the colonial governments could be very non-intrusive except for just assuring you know sort of free trade and contract enforcement yeah. and so on and that was sort of a liberal tradition throughout throughout the history of liberalism and you know and john stuart mill sort of had a, a weakness for that that opinion also and you can understand you know where that's coming from but in the end it's fundamentally destructive i think because it, it does fail to address this demand for dignity, this sort of dignity of equals that, that the, mm. the liberals should be offering instead of mm. kind of trying to take a shortcut that would violate dignity and maybe maybe make possible markets, but that shortcut is kind of self, self-destructive. It, it, it won't get you to kind of the liberal, the liberal society that people think they, they will get to. Mm. You know, I said a modern day version of this is sort of like the, the idea of chartered cities, which I'm, yeah. Somewhat sympathetic to, you know, you definitely want it. the idea of having kind of special economic zones where you try to have favorable conditions for exporting. That's that's fine. That was tried successfully in many places. That's okay. But maybe if you go sort of go too far in the charter cities direction, the, the idea that you should have parachute in institutions that is somewhat there's, there's an element of coercion there because you to make the yeah. charter city work, you have to sort of take away the ability of the locals to consent or not. To what's happening and mm -hmm. so you can see how it's again in a much more mild modest way sort of flirting with that colonial temptation of trying to parachute in the right institutions thinking that will give you that will give you the market outcomes you want and you know i think a lot of the liberal economists also and i i was like this during most of my career for sure is you know we think our job is to comment on what's good for material prosperity and that's a very successful discourse that we have had already and will continue to have and may, may we we maybe correctly think that that maybe that discourse is more persuasive than some kind of appeal to basic moral values would be in promoting liberalism hmm. i wonder if we can connect that this issue of a dignity actually back to the idea as of economics as a as a science. I mean, so you know, you said before, well, this question about dignity is not a scientific matter. But I do wonder whether it can actually be separated out from what are considered to be scientific questions quite so straightforwardly. So again, something that came up in some of the remarks to you at the lecture that you gave was think about something like the way economists discuss public goods problems. Mm -hmm. or various other technical examples of what are considered to be market failures. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of logic to these arguments which says in certain circumstances we can leave it to people to engage in consensual relationships, mm -hmm. but there are going to be others where there are certain technical conditions which mm -hmm. mean that markets may fail and hypothetically mm -hmm. at least you could think of some situation where some kind of government agency or a technocratic agency could improve the outcome. Yeah. And you could see that as a purely technical or scientific discussion. But there is a kind of moral yeah. component to this as well, where people assume not only that this is the case, but there tends to be a mm -hmm. sort of should argument that goes with this as well, that the government should right. intervene in these cases. And there's also an assumption, which is admittedly more of a, a kind of empirical one, that if you can identify these situations, 
then you you don't assume that the people themselves who are subject to the problem can figure a way out of it. So they right. can't figure right. out their own way out of a public goods problem. They require an external agent, almost like a colonial master, to come in and solve the public goods problem for them. And, you know, that was one of the arguments that Eleanor Ostrom, for example, was responding against. The idea that just mm -hmm. because you can identify a public goods problem doesn't mean you should assume that people can't figure a way out of it themselves. So I, I wonder whether there's something in the very logic of some of the sort of mainstream economic arguments that does actually lead to a form of paternalism, that the science, if you like, is itself not always respective of dignity. Yeah, um, those are those are great questions. I mean, I think, yeah, it's very traditional in the economics that I was trained in, for sure, that you think of a market failure like the, the lack of a public good, you need coercion to supply that public good. And certainly that's that's a very compelling argument that's been, you know, around since Adam Smith also. Yep. Adam Smith clearly wanted, you know, policemen, uh, you know, the, he did not envision a world of laissez-faire with no government coercion whatsoever. And I, I think it would be, be very rare to find anyone with no, any economist advocating zero, exactly yep. zero government coercion. I mean, there's some recognition that there is there is needs for for coercion. You can't have zero coercion. But but then so then how do you find sort of the right amount of coercion? That's and who's to decide what what is the right amount? So you know clearly I think what's what's lacking here is this sort of sense and to begin with that there is something that people don't want coercion. You know that coercion is sort of a violation for its own sake that they haven't aversion to coercion, <laughs> to come up with a rather lame rhyming phrase for that. Yeah. And sort of the, the economist argument focusing on sort of the material efficient functioning of markets is going to neglect that. It's going to not recognize that people might have a taste for a kind uh, an ability to consent. And certainly the, the right amount of coercion, we usually would think of that in a liberal society as being arrived at by some kind of uh, democratic discussion with some constraints on the ability of the authorities to violate the personal rights of, of individuals in the society. And, you know, so in a sense, once you recognize the kind of taste for, for consent, and, but that, that is, we know that's not the only thing going on. You know, it's, uh, we should also not jump to the assumption that sort of the consent versus coercion argument sort of trumps everything else. Of course, that's, yeah. that's yeah. not true either. There's a demand both for, kind of material prosperity and for consent and for freedom. Mm -hmm. And so what, what's going to happen is some societies are going to engage in some kind of search for the right combination of those two things. Yeah. But then, you know, in the end of the day, what does it come down to? It's, is it the economist that's going to decide the right combination mm -hmm. of freedom and, 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 you know, material prosperity? Or is it, you know, does the economists have any sort of special right or special expertise that would allow them to do that? I would say no, no, definitely not. That in itself is a matter for some finding some kind of democratic way to get the consent of the citizens to reach the right amount of of uh, combining, combining consent and material prosperity. And that may have happened during some kind of constitutional convention in which everyone agrees on the, the rules that constrain the government. They give a kind of bill of rights to citizens. We don't have like a simple, easy answer for how that happens. The, but the, the fundamental idea is this is not something that should be decided by the economists or by the experts. This is something that has to be part of a democratic process of, of consent. Yeah, I mean, that 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 seems quite persuasive to me. So I, I certainly take the argument that you it's a kind of utopian fantasy to believe that you can completely rid the world of coercion, that everything can be based on purely voluntaristic contractual relationships. I guess the thing that I'm getting at is that there seems to be, I don't know, within economics, for one reason or another, a somewhat of a bias. I mean, I guess some people would say economists are biased towards towards consent and towards markets. But my own my own feeling is that there's a bias towards finding reasons why you shouldn't rely on consent. So, I mean, I was very struck by 
again, going back to your lecture, there were str very strong parallels between the kind of arguments that were being made by colonial authorities um, in the past to the kind of arguments that are made today by behavioral economics. That yeah. people, yeah. if only they knew what their true preferences are, or if only they had the right willpower, yeah would yeah, support, yeah. support certain things that would make them better off. We just need to do it yeah. for this to be revealed to people. And the structure yeah, of the yeah. argument is almost identical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so to give a very simple example, there's uh, a, st a study by Michael Kramer, the Nobel laureate who I admire a lot, and some co-authors that find that, that some people in, the, in the, I forget the African setting in which they were, were, were collecting this information, but they found this kind of strange unwillingness for for women and other household workers who are gathering water for the household to sort of walk far enough to a clean spring, clean source of water. Yeah. And that the, 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 I say women because it's usually women carrying the water. Women seem to be kind of irrationally going to a closer water source which was contaminated which and was trying to make yeah. them sick from contamination. And so it seems like there's, you know, this irrationality going on and you need some kind of strong intervention to get some kind of, co some amount of coercion or a strong subsidy towards, you know, to getting them to go to the farther clean water source. Of course, you know, I, for, I think we should be thinking like, Maybe we're so arrogant that we think we know what the problem is. And we think, you know, because we think we understand it, we think we know it as a solution and can just kind of like impose a solution. When, you know, if we pause to think a moment, and I think if we had actually talked to some of the people involved, you know, you, you might become more aware of something like, well, there's a, a severe constraints on time available for women in the household. They have lots of things they need to achieve at the same time, you know, care for the children, provide the food, provide the water, you know, uh, work in the fields, uh, you know, all the things that, and, you know, they just don't have time to achieve the perfect solution on, on in every area. And so, you know, it's not irrationality, it's just that, that we, the rational experts, are failing to appreciate what, what their problem is, yes. what, what problem they're trying to, they're trying to solve. And this use of this use that I just did in this sentence of saying we and they is, a, is itself kind of like a, a very much an echo of colonial paternalism. The world of we and they. It's we, yeah. the, the the wise experts from developed countries who are telling them the the poor African women from a, a, a lump called developing countries that we know the right answer and we're going to sort of force them to accept it. That's you know, far more mild and not should not be tarnished with the same brush as kind of the evils of colonialism. It still is a kind of mindset that has not completely rejected the kind of colonial mindset. Well, I, I mean, I guess that that's the case, isn't it, for what you were saying about it would be OK if people came in as part of a discussion where they were offering to people possibilities that they could select right. from rather than right, something that right. is purely sort of imposed from outside. So it's about the framework right, within right. which these ideas are presented to people. Right, right. Very much, very much so, yeah. Hmm. So are you actually working on a book which is actually developing these ideas, did you say, about sort of dignity yes. and the role that this should play? In I wonder if you could say a bit about that. Yes, I have a, a second draft. Uh, of the book, and I'll be sending it in pretty soon to my publisher. Okay. And, and the tentative title is In the Name of Progress. Okay, great. You know, and again, the sort of theme of the book is, you know, don't think any any and all actions are justified in the name of progress. Mm. You know, a lot of these actions are violating the sort of consent and dignity and self-determination and equality that, that liberals, you know, sort of treasure. And so don't don't do immoral immoral stuff in the name of progress. It's sort of the, the simple idea, you know, very simple idea. But yeah, and I I think there's like super. I'm going through lots and lots of concrete examples. You know, the theory of benevolent slavery, the the early sort of development mission from 1787. The British sent to Sierra Leone in an attempt to 
kind of bring development to the African continent and also offer Black people from England kind of, basically part of this was there are Black people in England that were freed slaves that the British sort of wanted to get rid of and hope to sort of kill two birds with one stone by sending them to Sierra Leone to start a kind of free labor colony that would you know, also help bring development to, the, to Africans in Sierra Leone. And it was all sort of a, a moral and, and practical catastrophe when they tried to do this, but it did lead to kind of the foundation of colonialism in Sierra, Le in Sierra Leone. So just like one example out of a, after another, you know, the, the conquest of Native Americans in the U.S. and the name yeah. of the name of development that we can do, we the, the Europeans can develop the, the land better than they the, the Indians can, and we can even bring benefits to the Indians by by you know teaching them our our great uh, techniques and and governmental institutions to bring them to a higher level of prosperity but never sort of consulting them on whether they wanted to steal or not. So just sort of going over and over again throughout, throughout history of these examples. I mentioned King Leopold's Congo, you know, we, sort of debate on colonialism after World War I when Wilson sort of embraced the idea of kind of mandates in which the so-called civilized countries would kind of look over the former German colonies and guiding them to development, sort of reiterating the colonial, colonial idea of development over and over again. Can we just pursue the the Native American example actually just just for a moment because it, it's one I find re find really interesting. I mean, you put up again some really startling figures in your your talk, which showed that if you looked at the narrative of the colonialists who were saying, um, you know, if we dispossess these people of their lands, this will actually result in benefits for them. Their incomes will go up, output will go up, right. all these sorts of things. And if you put up the statistics to show, well, actually looking at the ball statistic, that almost seems to be true that Native American incomes, although they are considerably lower than those of the average US citizen, have increased dramatically since the period when their lands were, were removed from them. But the argument you're making is, at what price in terms of the dignity uh, of those people? Now, I'm I was very convinced by that argument, but I'm also wary of of another sort of paternalism <laughs> here, which is I know from my own experience. Once I went to it's over 20 years ago. I, I went to the Pine Ridge Reservation in in South Dakota. I think it, 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 it I think it is, and I was shocked by it. I mean, it is a very depressing atmosphere yeah. from my viewpoint but at the same time you know what what can I recommend to those people without then imposing my own projection on them again of oh this looks like a desperate place you need some other form of deliverance to get you out from this when it was that kind of saviorism that arguably was part of the problem in the first place so how do we okay. escape from this in a case like that yeah, so, and I think the the obvious thing to say is that there is no easy answer, and I'm not sure I or or anyone else has any yeah. has a, a super super constructive or easy easy answer. And sort of the lack of easy answers sometimes used to kind of justify like not having this discussion at all. Yeah, you know, let's just forget up all that nonsense yeah. about you know the historical use of development to justify dispossession and conquest and colonialism let's just forget about all that and let's just concentrate on the, the constructive things we can do today about world poverty and i think that's probably where the vast majority of development economists would come out yeah. and then they would you know then send some kind of expert mission to the pine ridge reservation and try, try to do the best possible to make those things better and you know i, I can have a lot of sympathy for, for that viewpoint but what it, what is lost with that kind of compromise that you you do? Let's forget about the about values and dignity and consent and just concentrate on the material stuff that we know we we somewhat know what to do about. What gets lost is you you keep having new violations of of kind of rights and dignity when you when you have that mindset, you know, and and the the new violations themselves will involve sometimes involve pretty obvious coercion like military military interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan yep. and Syria and Libya, Somalia, you know, the list goes on and on, but Uganda and sort of giving 
lot of aid to our allies in the war on terror, which is strengthening authoritarian governments that violate, routinely violate the rights and dignity of their own citizens. And we're sort of tolerating that in the name of, again, tolerating that in the name of progress, in the name of material progress. Yeah. So just because those who advocate moral, moral liberal rights don't have like an easy answer, that's that in itself does not allow you to kind of dismiss the debate on moral liberal rights. Yeah, you, you don't you don't get it that that easy just by saying, you know, you must have an answer or else we'll we'll just mm. discuss dismiss all of this we'll concern about mm. about dignity and freedom and and go right back to, which is you know ironically very much the same thing that was happening in previous rounds of Indian dispossession in the U.S. Yeah. You know. People were saying, oh, let's, you know, forget about all this crap about land rights and all that. Let's just concentrate on teaching, teaching the Cherokees and the Creeks how to how to have peach orchards and, you know, mm -hmm. grow, grow, grow corn and, and use our, our great techniques for doing that. That's going to be in their own material self-interest. But of course, that led to the, the Trail of Tears in the 1830s, which dispossessed the Creeks and the Cherokees. And, sent them in, into west of the Mississippi into lands which they were taking from the yet other other Indians and you know having a, a bad outcome for for you know decades decades after that. So the moral of the story is you think you can escape the moral debate, but you, you really can't. Yeah. You just really cannot. We, we cannot have kind of unlimited justification of everything and anything in the name of progress. Yeah, no, I think that's a very, very powerful point. So, so, Bill, when do you think? When is this book going to be ready? When do you? When are we expecting this to to come out? I mean, it sounds like it's going to be a terrific read, <laughs> like uh, the other books. <laughs> Sorry, I'm choking out of in a sort of. Kind of <clears throat> I'm finding your question a little bit funny because that's, <laughs> that's what all book authors get get tormented by all the, all the time you know when are you going to be done when is your book going to be yeah done? yeah including my publisher you know very much <laughs> as well <laughs> uh, books always take a lot longer than you think they will yeah uh, no, I'd be, I, I know I, I, I'm just about to finish one myself. I thought it was going to take me two years to do it. It's ended up being three years so I do under, I do know that feeling. Yeah yeah you know a lot of times people don't don't finish books at, at all. You know, and that's I know <laughs> the people I've talked to who said I have this book I'm working on and sort of never happens. Yeah. At all. So I hope to stay ahead of that that curve by at least fin finally finishing the book. Well, whenever the book comes out, it's been great to talk to you. And thank you very much for giving the the lecture to us. And yeah, I look Pleasure. forward to carrying on the conversation in the future. So thank you very much, Bill Easterly. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you.